regarding the battle of a future dystopia or utopia? Having questions prepared after the panel has gone through rounds on the table uh, and discussed this topic. The artistically vague topic and you can interpret how you will. Well, look, I'll start off by um, making a point that a, dis, um, that a dystopia is um, meant to be not an anti-utopia, but a flawed utopia. So when we're thinking about all the great things that um, you know, the future could bring us and so like you know, um, the self-transformation of the species, and I've got to say I actually do fund fundamentally disagree with the idea of, a, of, 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 the, of the future war. Uh, because mainly I don't think there will be the organised the or, the organised labour to actually cause it. Um, I am interested in how um, good intentions and well intentioned sort of developments in technology may actually have a uh, a tragic component which causes their own unravelling, and I would see that as the dystopia. Uh, thanks. Again, apologies. My voice is a bit husky because uh, I'm a bit ill. Look, I, the first thing I, I'd like to say is it seems to me if we're thinking about the future, we need to think in a way uh, which is rigorous and which allows the distinction uh, between uh, being a crank and being a radical thinker. It, it, it seems to me that there's a, um, a space for common sense here uh, that once we abandon it, uh, we might as well be writing science fiction. I love science fiction. Science fiction is good fun. Uh, but there's more to thinking, discussing rigorously about um, social and political trajectories than just uh, plucking numbers out of the air. But those set of conceptual tools are too thin uh, to think about uh, the future with. Uh, we need to be very careful about an argument that goes, uh, nothing I've said is impossible, therefore it'll happen. Uh, we need to be very careful about um, reasoning by induction. Just because the price of tulips has doubled every year for five years doesn't mean that this tulip is going to be worth 20 trillion dollars uh, in 20 years. Okay, uh, so And that means that we need to think carefully about these claims about Moore's law. Okay, it's not a law of physics, uh, it's a historical generalisation. There might be social and political pressures uh, pushing it, but of course uh, climate change, civilizational collapse for other reasons will interrupt that. It's not an inevitability. So we certainly, before we can even ask the question, dystopia and utopia, uh, we need a much richer uh, sense of what it is to think uh, seriously about the future. Uh, in that context, I have to say, um, we need to be looking uh, much more closely at the humanities. You can't do politics. Uh, with maths, you can't do politics with physics, uh, you need to do politics with history, sociology and economics. Uh, the major political forces, uh, the major human forces driving social and technological change uh, in this world are economic forces. Uh, they're very hard to understand, uh, but there's, you know, there's an entire discipline uh, there, uh, and it's not simply a matter of uh, kind of waving some order of magnitudes around. Then my vote goes for dystopia because I simply cannot see us meeting the challenge of climate change. For all the you know, wonderful things that the species is capable of in the past, for all of the kind of, oh, we'll sort this stuff out, every single goal that governments have set of dealing with climate change we have missed. Okay? Rates of carbon emission are above the worst case scenarios. There is no evidence that our, our species is currently making the difficult social and political choices that are required to address the climate, uh, challenge of climate change. So I actually think most of this stuff about the Adelaide War, um, whether it's true or not, we're not going to get there. Okay? We, we'll be looking at a collapse of the food chain and then Moore's Law can take a, a hike. Um, so yeah, my vote goes for uh, dystopia. I, I guess I'd like to say one more thing about um, a mode of argument, again, which goes, which kind of tells a fantasy story and says, well, look, this could happen, therefore we'd all, all better behave as though it's going to happen. Sometimes it's worth taking those arguments seriously and just seeing what would follow. So imagine if I could show that there was a group of people plotting, you know, in a cave in Pakistan to start a war between Christians and Muslims that was going to kill a billion people. We really thought that was going to happen. 
the cruise missiles will be in the air as we speak. Okay, so if you really think that the future involves a war which is going to kill a billion people, you don't even need to be Terran to say we should be rioting outside the IO labs now. Uh, so again, uh, when we hear these very kind of grand speculative claims, look, it's fun, uh, you know, you can write some good books, some good science fiction, uh, but sometimes it's worth taking them seriously just for a moment and saying, well, if someone said that in another scenario, someone said that in the context of ordinary geopolitics, what would follow? You get some very radical conclusions. So sad to say, my vote's for dystopia, but I think that the skills that we need to talk about these issues are, are not just uh, a kind of mode of reasoning uh, that fantasizes without limits. I'd just like to say that when <coughs> Rob calls economics a discipline, we should have put quotes around it. And then I'll pass it over to Diego. Uh, I, I agree with you strongly that the social sciences should get involved. And, and rather critically, the American movement, because it's too techie-based, with the inherent bias. And, and I, I suffer from it. And I'd very much like to see the philosophers and historians and sociologists and psychologists social science people get involved, because this issue is so enormous that uh, you, you need a thing. Um, and for 10 years, uh, those of you here on the seventh, are saying, uh, for 10 years, I've been trying to persuade Peter Singer, the inspired philosopher, to, to write a book on after that ethics. But he just didn't write. He just, he just wasn't ready. So it, it's not surprising that it's the techies who get there first. And uh, it's probably also not surprising that in America it's, it's dominated by the techies. Firstly, the techies get there first because it's, that's, that's their job, it's the technological trends. And two, you're talking about a country that's one of the richest in the world with 300 million people. So you know, they, can, they can collect this tiny minority group and still have a large enough number to, to create a whole movement. So I think that's, that's happening in the US. But here in Australia, it's, it's good. It's, it's more than mix. So, okay, now the other side. <sighs> what science fiction and what is uh, enlightened? Like, I can make an analogy, it's easy to do. Uh, first, uh, Winston Churchill. Right? In 35 to 39, he was rattling people's cages like crazy. A war with Nazis, a war with Hitler is coming this thing, and nobody listened to him. They didn't want to listen to him. Why? Because of, you know, and he recently suffered through the massive trauma of the First World War. He suffered so heavily. They didn't want to even think about it. Okay. So, yeah. uh, well, how, how long do you think wars will, will, will last? And if uh, the chromatic, like this, this History Channel thing, uh, one of the seven, the, the, the title of the program to our special is Futurists. And certainly one of the, the guys we'll be talking about is the climate change issue. But well, to me, that's still all very human. Right? It, it, it's all at the human level. Whereas I'm trying to get the message across, right? it's hard to imagine a creature that's a trillion, trillion times above. But that's what the physics says is possible. And I'll just leave it open there. So, uh, possible and real are just different things. I mean, that's what is quite extraordinary here. Just because something's possible doesn't mean you have the faintest clue how to actually do it, or that there's any sign of anyone uh, doing it. Uh, now, there's a mode of argument that goes, Galileo was persecuted and mocked, I'm persecuted and mocked, therefore I'm Galileo. Uh, okay, and it just doesn't work. And for every kind of brave, radical futurist who predicted satellites, who predicted, uh, you know, the internet, there's a whole lot of cranks out there who claim that we'd have, you know, atomic power in our basements in 1950, that the mail would be delivered by rockets uh, that would all be flying around in jet cars. Okay, so when someone makes a technological prediction, take it with a grain of salt. If, if the word, I'm an avid reader of New Scientist magazine, but every single article in that magazine starts, this could, mean such and such. And, and I always meant to do this, was to go back and look at an edition in 1970 
And so you have all the things that could have happened, how many of them actually did? And I actually have to say, I suspect the hit rate's fairly, uh, fairly poor. So clearly things are going to change. Technology is amazing. Uh, but it's also worth thinking about, is your life fundamentally different now than it was 10 years ago? <coughs> I was quite serious uh, about the change from 1890 to 1900 being more radical from 1990 to 2000. Yes, we can use the internet. Yes, we can use mobile phones. But actually, if you take a look at your life, you're basically working in an office or a university or a checkout. Uh, and um, your social and political power hasn't changed. There's still a whole lot of dictatorships out there. Uh, the governments are still capable of running these insane laws. Uh, I was just reading the newspaper today, one-fifth of Americans I still believe Obama's a Muslim. Okay, I mean, just having the capacity doesn't get you the social and political change. Slavery didn't disappear because people stopped believing it. It believed because people stopped existing because people constructed a vicious political struggle uh, to overcome it. So it's not just a matter of having the technology, having the capacity. It's also a matter of having the political will and the social forces. Uh, so please take it all with a grain of salt. Not just because something could happen doesn't mean it's going to. Well, I, I would actually, um, and I agree with much of what Rob and you have said, which puts me in a difficult situation. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and, and I've got to tell you, it's not often that I'm having this discussion where I feel like I'm the most reasonable person in the room. Uh, usually, I'm the kook in the corner, you know. Um, I, I have to argue with Rob, I don't think that slavery uh, in the US anyway ended because people uh, started the war for any social justice reasons. It was purely economic reasons where the North saw an opportunity to get a lead in the war with the South by saying, well, if, you, uh, if we win, we'll end slavery. And it created uh, a, you know, a, a class struggle. And I'm being a good Marxist, I believe that history is all about the class struggle. And I think the same is true when I think about uh, the questions that Rob is rightfully asking, what is going to drive these changes ahead? I tend to come back to economics, as loose as discipline as I believe it really is, but money and power and class struggle and do those three things. I mean, if we look at jetpacks, why don't we have a jetpack? Why don't we have the electric car? Why don't we have uh, uh, nuclear power in our basement? You know, one of the explanations for the failure of all three of those grand visions, if you leave aside the technology, is about money, power, class struggle. Did the, did the, uh, the wealthy elite see those, the, the, the realisation of those things to be in their net best interests or not. And then if we think about the ever advancement of computational power and breaking through the perceived uh, limitations of Moore's law today, is breaking through those barriers going to be in the perceived net best interest of those people today that have the money and power and therefore are prepared to fund them and push them and advance them. Uh, and I'm, I'm on the border with those. I mean, the history of the last 50 or 60 years tells us that yes, there is perceived economic benefit in ever increasing computational power. And so, you know, Intel continues to build trillion dollar plants and fabrication plants to push the boundary to the point. Uh, is there also this, this rising um, trend, particularly driven by the, the Reagan religious right that says, ooh, this can, technology thing is bad, people are actually talking. And I, I, I would also agree with Rob that one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years that didn't happen before is, is WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks couldn't have existed in 1990. WikiLeaks definitely is you know, becoming a political force today. Um, uh, he's making me like, you know, I'm scared. It hasn't ended those wars, though. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but it's, 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 you know, it's got people talking. It's, it's got the, the powers that be scared enough that they're trying to do something about Julian. Um, they're trying to bring him down quickly. It's like, shut that kid up. Where did he come from? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he should be here today. Um, you know, so that's the question for me, and I'm interested in, in, in the rest of the panelists and the audience's view on that. It, 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 the, the perceived economic and power benefits as the net gain 
and strong enough to see these things push through or at some stage will they try and pull the pin on? Yeah, look, we'll go to an audience once we start seeing some raised hands, but um, oh, look at them. Oh. <laughs> okay, very quickly. Um, look, uh, I'll just quickly so I jot down what I, you know, I managed to jot down a few notes. Um, 1890s. Okay, there's a great little book out there called The Victorian Internet. Um, all sorts of technologies have happened so like, since the Victorian period. They would not have been at all surprised with the internet because they had telegraph. And in many ways, it was, it's very equivalent. Um, very quickly on the, uh, the, the bold, um, you know, um, bold conjectures need strong proof. So I really saw, like, support that idea. One of the people that was actually saw, like, providing strong proofs and predicting um, the, the, um, the, uh, a, a war with Germany a long time before it happened, of course, with Maynard Keynes, who pointed out that the, um, that the, the, uh, the onerous um, um, repayments that were required by Germany would lead to so like a rise of totalitarianism and lo and behold it did. Um, the climate change issue, I want to get back to something I gave in my presentation where I referred to a conflict in the organising principle of society which really dates back, way back from Adam Smith who really first noticed it. Um, Ricardo saw like a greeter but all the classical political economists um, followed it up to around about the 1890s when um, neoclassical evolution came along and they dropped political um, economy like a hot potato and that is the conflict that we're going to see between, um, well pretty much as Ricardo said, between the rest of society and landlordism. Okay, that is going to be huge and really the only way we're going to sort of like meet these government targets and climate change and so on and so forth is by actually addressing that problem, actually putting a price on our use of resources. That is the only way it's going to be done, and some people aren't happy with that because they profit from that at the moment. You know, we're seeing very nascent debates at the moment, so like beginning to percolate through in Australia at the moment. Um, examples of the landlordism versus environmental debate um, occurring uh, in the proposals for a climate tax or an ETS system. Um, they occur in the, um, the mining tax debate. Who owns the resources that actually belong under the ground? I can see someone saying us, yes, you're absolutely right. I agree with you 100%. Um, and also one of the things that was overlooked in the, um, uh, overlooked in the uh, Henry Review of Australia's Future Tax System, that was dropped, um, was a proposal to get rid of stamp duties, all those taxes on transactions, etc., and actually have a federal land tax. Um, that actually used to be Labor Party policy for the first 60 years of that party and was um, forgotten at the 1961 conference. Um, all that aside, very quickly, the Moore's Law. Can it be predicted? Um, can it, will it continue? That seems to be so like a, a, a sticking bone of contention over so like what sort of future speculations that we engage in. Um, as I sort of like um, blurted out during the discussion, when Moore wrote his paper, it was actually a study of things that had occurred previously to him writing his paper and said, if this goes on, this will continue. And as recently as I think it was 2003, so like Don Moore himself was saying, yeah, I think, it, I think it's going to bubble along for a little while longer. Um, one thing we can be sure of, even if, the, even if the law slows down and what have you, com computational power will keep on increasing. Okay? It's not going to go backwards, um, barring sort of like great disaster. Um, will it get past the sort of capacity of the human brain itself? Well, yes, of course, you use, if necessary, you use a clustered system or a geographically dispersed um, grid computing system. That capacity, that capacity is there. Will that mean that the machine in question has got a greater intelligence than humans? That is an unknown, an absolute unknown, because raw processing power does not equate with intelligence one iota. Um, you know, our intelligence is linguistically mediated. And until you saw, I can actually saw, like, point to me and say, look, here's a, talk, walk, here's a talking computer um, that has um, a, uh, a command of language and can generate with other computers, other members of the species, shared symbolic values. It is not intelligent as we understand it. Questions? Oh, we've got one up there. Oh, look, oh, hang on. Now I've, I've stirred a hornet's nest. Please go. <laughs>
sounds heretical, but do I think of climate change, global warming issue as small beer, like in, in comparison to, to the other issue? Because, because, because it's, it's never really changed, it's small beer. Well, in oh, Paris, higher, higher in scale. Oh. So this, this reminds me once, I have an argument once with, a, with a, an older Jew who went through uh, Auschwitz. Um, I, I, I guess it's the emotional versus the numerical. But, you know, I'm a numbers guy. And, and I say, look, okay, so for you Jews, what happened was horrible. I mean, my second wife's mother was gassed at Auschwitz. So it's close to home. But it's small beer in comparison to what the Nazis did to the Russians. I feel 20 or 30 million. So, so that kind of thing. So, um, so if there is a, there is major disaster on, on the climate change issue, and, and what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Well, it's forced to move. Well, if, if, if you're looking at the higher end of the scale and looking at a, a five and a half degree change, then you end up with sort of like you know, um, well, most of the world has moved. Okay. Okay. You're looking you're looking at sort of like the fertile plains of Antarctica, <coughs> maybe. But it's still on a human scale. That, and that's my point. Because how do you imagine a creature that's like a trillion, trillion times above you? You can not even imagine. But it's of a different order of magnitude. It's, it's, a, it's a, a post. <coughs> when you talk about transhumanism, but <laughs> what is it? In the form of a slogan. That, that illustrates the point. Transhumanist is to an artifact as a trans reptile is to a mammal. You see what I mean? You see what I'm trying to go? It's a different order of magnitude type of problem. It's qualitatively hugely above it, I mean, obviously it's an issue, but you know, a big one. But it's not in the same ballpark. playing with marbles, and, and the marbles actually a whole galaxy. <laughs> so these, these hyper-creatures, if they come into these godlike creatures, if they come into being, like one of the sections of the first book, I'm speculating, speculating on, well, if they did it, what would they do? What would they do? I mean, they'd be a normal, how would they spend their time? If time had any meaning. And one speculation is that they would build universes play around with the laws of physics. So if, if you did that, then stands the reason that we, I mean that unit, part of it, is, is in fact a, a product of one of these creatures. Now, Hugo, how is this just not old-fashioned Bible um, content? This is just not <laughs> a complete <laughs> religious you, faith. You've, 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 got to, you've got to get into the physics community. Don't, don't you realize that there's, 
This bit of the absolute turnaround of physics and the cosmological communion had gone right back to religion. And I don't, I don't mean in the theistic sense, but in the deistic sense. And, and it's, it, it's being forced on by, by you know, the, the study. I mean, these fundamental particle physicists you know, looking at all their constants. Like, the universe, you can, you can sort of twiddle with roughly about 20 variables. But at least you've outed yourself now as, uh, as someone selling us a story based on religious faith and, and speculation. No, no, no. It's extraordinary to hear this in the context of applying science versus no, faith. I've been an atheist for decades. I don't know, it's, I mean, God-like machines? Yeah. Well, I started saying that's a nice thing. Yeah. 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 Ask a question of the audience, just with a show of hands. How many people? <laughs> how many people think humans are doing a good job of uh, running things at the moment? Ten percent, maybe, maybe twenty percent. Because, because here's here's my concern. Here's my concern. 
here's my con the reason the reason I'm a singularitarian can we have a new and a uh, uh, yeah is that um, I, I, I'm pessimistic about our chances of getting through this century without wiping out 90 odd percent of all life on the planet um, I think we're doing a dismally poor job. I think we're fundamentally flawed. I think this uh, limbic system that we inherited from our primate ancestors is just the death knell of us unless we evolve through it bloody quickly. And um, so, you know, when I'm weighing up, when I'm weighing up the uh, potential futures, um, uh, I apologise to my room for every time I turn her on. Too, by the way. Um, when I'm weighing up the few, you know, okay, uh, an artelect war versus humans just wiping everything out anyway with the, uh, uh, you know, 1962 all over again, I, um, I, I kind of get to the conclusion that my alliance cannot be to humanity. If I have to draw, if I have to form an alliance, it has to be to the perpetuation of intelligent life in some way, shape, or form. You mean, it, I mean, Hugo talks about potentially billions of planets supporting life out there, and that's potentially true, but it is a theory. You know, depending on how you read the Drake equation and how you handle Fermi's paradox, it could also be just us. It could be a, there could be a, a window of opportunity between when intelligent species become intelligent enough to wipe themselves out and actually succeed in doing so. Um, it could be just us, and if it is just us, uh, we are the, I mean, depending on if you want to think there's a purpose to 13.7 billion years of a universe, but maybe we are the high point of 13.7 billion years of achingly slow evolution. And if we frack it up, that's on our shoulders. So part of me strongly feels that we need to move through and we need to, we need to pass the torch to an intelligence that isn't lumbered with a limbic system as quickly as possible. Can I just briefly... <laughs> Can I just have a couple of quick observations. I'm still not sure why we're not talking about the threat posed by genetically modified squid. Okay. Uh, we have a technology that can genetically modify a squid. Uh, you can't prove to me that it's against the laws of physics that someone might genetically modify them so they become the left to take over the world. Oh my God, let's have a debate about that. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a range of threats out there and you need some common sense uh, to distinguish which ones uh, are worth talking about. Uh, there's a real danger here from a community that prides itself on its relationship to science the way people talk about evolution and natural selection is frightening. Evolution, natural selection, they don't have a direction. They don't head up. They don't head up. If we wipe ourselves out and cockroaches take over the planet, that doesn't mean they're superior beings. It just means that they're the ones that are left. Okay? So the natural selection does not have a direction. You can't rely upon these arguments for evolution and evolutionary change. It's bad. It's bad biology. No, it's not even clear that it complexifies. Okay. Now, let's have a look at what people are putting their faith in. Okay. I can imagine a world in which people rise up, overthrow their landlords, uh, dispossess the, uh, all the billionaires of the world, redistribute that wealth, uh, and live in environmental harmony with the planet. I can imagine that. I can put some faith in that. Or I can imagine that as the food chains collapse, that as the habitable zones of the planet move, Someone will generate a nice AI that will sort this shit out for us. <laughs> okay. Now, there's a choice there about where you want to put your faith. And, and it's profoundly depressing uh, that some people contributing to this debate are not willing to put their faith in the people. It's going to be people who make the machines. Uh, so it seems to me there's a realistic thing that we could be striving for, which is to combat a real threat, which is climate change. Or we could spend our time fantasizing about what might happen if, if people did something that we haven't got a clue how to do. Okay? And it's a question about where you put the word climate change. It's important. Sorry, you didn't bash it here.
in terms of all <laughs> in your three categories, I would like to propose that they suffer from a presumption. The presumption is called by Frankenstein syndrome. It presumes that some, one or many of man's creations will rise and destroy him, extinguish him. Well, let me propose a fourth category that we didn't in the claim. Let me call it archaeolectism. An archaeolect which has a gigantic IQ and intellectual intelligence, why can the author also have a giant emotional intelligence, an EQ, that it might see cooperating with we mere ants as an optimal management strategy? That it might have a, a humongous social intelligence and all the good things. Why do our creations have to inherit our faults? Why could they not just perceive that there's a better way to do it than we cracks have done it and move on and evolve themselves into a better scheme for managing the planet and curing climate change? And to an extent, that's got a greater possibility because, well, you know, very much, you know, you're dealing with, um, um, you know, you're dealing with uh, spe spe uh, specialisations. You're dealing with um, one, I suppose, if you want to call it life form that can do um, computation incredibly quickly, and you're dealing with another life form that can actually interact with the world with, uh, in the flesh and blood. So, yeah. and this is one of the most depressing panels I've heard. Because <laughs> we, we have to death by climate change. I'm underwhelmed. stores of food because they were aware that something could go wrong uh, and you might have to um, you know, live off the stores for a couple of days. I mean, I've got maybe two days of food at home. If the Woolworths truck drivers go on strike, I start to starve. Uh, now it seems to me that if, uh, I don't know, the um, you know, supply of plankton in the ocean uh, starts to plummet so that the world fisheries collapse, uh, people are going to be too worried about getting enough food. To move the front up to the jobs of the uh, laboratories everywhere. Uh, yeah, it's essentially, I think we're now in a kind of global planetary crisis. I mean, this is mental here as well. Uh, I mean, no, it's, but at least we have some kind of ways of thinking about that. How to speculate about what vast artificial intelligence will, will, will do? I mean, we're really in the realm of fantasy. I mean that. We are just speculating. But actually, we can think a bit about what would happen uh, if huge sections of the planet become uninhabitable or we can't uh, feed ourselves. Uh, and it's not looking too good for continuing our program that's from our research. Yeah. Uh, I think what you technology, you know, uh, 
Recently, I've seen some pretty interesting developments. For instance, Hod Hodgson, has anybody ever heard of him? He's developed an AI without being told what to do, an evolved AI, which has worked out pretty much Newtonian mechanics by watching a pendulum swing. Um, this is also called, the, you can also get a downloadable science, scientist, which will pick out what it, it thinks is interesting patterns in large subsets of data that then scientists can come along and choose which one's really interesting to them. Um, so, look, there's been a gradual increase, or maybe uh, a sudden increase, depending on whether you're judging it by a, a geological time scale or a human time scale, of us increasingly depending on mechanics, machinery, computers, to help us in our decision making, in a, in to offload our sort of our intellect in some ways so that we can focus on other jobs. It seems to be an increasing phenomenon. Um, I just can't see how you you think it's completely fan, like fantasia that we one day go to build something far more capable of um, decision making and um, off offloading our intellect onto than we have today. Yeah, I mean, just because we don't have a theory of the mind doesn't necessarily mean we won't have one in the future. Even if we don't, we may be able to evolve an artificial intelligence without understanding how the mind works. But this is the argument, because I can't prove that it's impossible, it's inevitable. No. And that's a really, no, no, that's no, a no, no. Actually, really no, sorry. I, I never said it was inevitable. Okay, well, well uh, that, we should, that we should spend our time worrying about. Doesn't it worry anyone that when we had steam engines, people thought that the mind was a vast steam engine? You know, we've got computers, people think the mind's a computer. But we didn't have MRI scanners back then either. I mean, we have, we have a, a, an understanding of the neuroelectrics of the brain now that back up a theory of the computer model for the brain and the mind, whereas we didn't have that 100 years ago. We still did. People have been predicting robot butlers just around the corner for 50 years. Uh, okay. I mean, there's a question here about how you should respond to these claims about speculation. They, it might all be true. Absolutely. Should I stop everything and worry about the AIs because it might be true? Well, actually, that takes some common sense. We've got a real crisis. Uh, should we be spending our time um, worrying about one? But how much money are we spending on developing AIs compared to, okay, building nuclear weapons or, or developing you know, a new well, How much money do we put into the cosmetic industry? How much money is spent each year on lipstick or on eyeshadow or on a new pair of shoes, Nike or whatever? So if, it's, if it is possible, if, it's, uh, if there is concern that this is a, a possible future, then why shouldn't we um, put some resources into it? Well, there are lots of people and lots of issues. I mean, some people can specialise in some issues and other people can specialise in other issues. You talk about the weight of the, the, the amount of economy and the amount of uh, human power being put into um, like AI or biotech. Running. Main, uh, we're running out of yeah. so quick Quickly, um, actually, it's like a comparison, actually, get, getting back to the original theme about whether the future is going to be a utopia or a dystopia. Of course, it can actually be the flawed utopia um, because um, I find myself in a position where I both um, agree with the trajectory that's being mapped out for climate change and global warming and what that implies, and also I agree with the um, trajectories being marked out for so like, you know, development of, art, um, of compu um, computational power and the prospects of artificial intelligence. And you know what? I think we're going to get both. One more question. <laughs> First person to stand up and start yeah. with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, my question is, will we, if, if the singularity does happen, then my, my uh, impression is that it will happen by the time people realise it. Because most people, there's this massive scepticism of the people on the humanity side, mm. and it's the mirroring the scepticism around the global warming. Until it's happened, most people, I don't think, will be deeply believe it. And it's particularly true in the next exponential thing. Mm -hmm. You think about the internet, didn't exist, or it's just for a few summers, and it's everywhere, you know, and almost overnight. So, how will this, you know, war happen in, in the sense that it will happen, but um, you know, it's not going to be real. I call that the climbing time, and, and it's a critical variable. Like, there, there are scenarios where humanity does escape 
and, and the other lakes come into being. And, and one of them is, is that uh, they're brought into being far more quickly than we <coughs> would anticipate. And so suddenly they're there, they're fated completely, they exist. And they look around and say, oh, God, this tiny little speck the earth, this is not the place for us. And so they, they choose to go elsewhere, because there's a whole universe out there. And humanity escapes. But for me, the most likely, the most probable scenario is, is the works. Now, I'm a professional, a professional brain builder. So every day, I, I'm asking, how do, you, how do you build a brain? And I don't know. I read a lot of neuroscience, and all these brain builder guys, these BAs, these brain architects, they read a lot of neuroscience, they're trying to get ideas. And I think almost to, 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 to an individual, I'll probably tell you that the human brain is probably the most complex humanly known, well, known object in the humanly known universe. Because it's, well, to the, you know, a, a quadrillion centimeters. So it's going to take a long time figuring out how that works. So I think there will be, but, and it'll be in steps. You know, this particular component will be better understood, and there'll be new technologies, and then nanotech will create little robots that can go to every synapse and radio broadcast the synaptic strength in its position. So it, it will take time, it will take decades. So, so I believe, you know, as, as each step is reached, uh, the technologies that go with it, you know, they'll come into being. So I think there will be enough time, you know, climbing time, between well, what, when, when the robots become sufficiently intelligent to be useful, so hence industry, and, and the level where they're so intelligent they're threatened. So that, that number of years, I think call it the climbing time. I think we'll be long enough for human politics to unfold. I, I, I see that as more realistic than the sudden, you know, the sharp takeoff that the Americans talk, talk about. So uh, that's, that makes me very pessimistic. Come in very briefly on that. So we can't predict it. We can't notice it. We can't understand it. And we can't avoid it. But is it much worth talking about once that's... Wait a second. You can't predict it. But can you forecast the weather? Can you predict the weather? No, we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should bring in the word probabilities here. It's yeah. a critical variable. Yeah. Okay, anyway, um, look, we've had a panel. Now we're going to have to quickly transition to uh, the next.